great pleasure that I can introduce to you Manfred Laubichler today. Um, he is one of our very own here at the Center of Evolution and Medicine. He's a pre uh, pre President's Professor of Theoretical Biology and History of Biology and the Director of the Global Biosocial Complex Initiative. He also recently uh, co-founded or he's a co-director of the Center for Biosocial Complex Systems here at ASU. Um, and today he's here to talk about his own research. So with further ado, please help me welcome Manfred, please. Okay, well, thanks, Sylvie. Uh, I guess for the majority of people here, I might as well be a visitor because they never find me or see me. Uh, so it's great to be at ASU. Uh, to deliver what's called the Halloween lecture. I'm actually in costume, so five brownie points, whoever knows what costume that is. You're all ignorant Americans. No, and, and you don't know any physics anyway. So somebody can look it up. Holtzman, <laughs> yes. Anyway, uh, there was an interesting uh, mishap in some of the email communications announcing this, where they shortened the title to simply, what does evolutionary medicine need? Uh, and the answer to this is, of course, psychotherapy. But uh, what I want to talk about is what, does, what evolutionary theory does evolutionary medicine need, because that's more along the lines of what I am doing. So uh, I will not show any equations, although I was very tempted in doing that, because we are producing some very elegant new math. But uh, we do it mainly conceptual uh, with some examples, uh, trying to convince you that if we, if we look at evolutionary medicine as one of those areas where we look for evolutionary theory to provide a conceptual framework that would help us better uh, deal with a problem, in this case disease, then it would be appropriate to not do that based on an evolutionary theory that is about 70 years out of date. And uh, unfortunately, it, whenever you see evolutionary something, whether it's evolutionary economics, uh, cultural evolution, um, aesthetic evolution, you name it, uh, the tendency is to go back to a simple version of evolutionary theory that sort of was up to date around the mid 20th century and to then miss some of the more interesting developments that have happened since. And a lot of those interesting developments and challenges within evolutionary theory actually happened in uh, interaction with different domains of application. So no longer just worrying about adaptation and speciation and whatever else you have in your evolutionary biology textbook, but to have a broader conception of evolutionary uh, phenomena. And in this case, disease uh, and evolutionary medicine falls in that category. So uh, let's sort of set the stage. Sort of the challenge that we are facing here can be one that, from a very broad perspective, and I'm starting with the Anthropocene because um, we're also part of the Global Futures uh, Laboratory here at ASU. And uh, obviously, the Anthropocene is an interesting context for all of that. So we have entered the Anthropocene. Um, for those of you not familiar with this, this is almost uh, an agreed upon new geological era, uh, defined by the fact that human activity is now the major geological force acting on the planet. Now, if you ask yourself, how can that happen? Of course, it's a consequence of some very complex coevolutionary dynamics that facilitated our species to have that impact. Uh, as a consequence, in the Anthropocene, we are shaping and engineering uh, the planet at a global scale. Uh, and that matters because we are pushing towards what's recognized as planetary boundaries, which means that we are no longer safely within a habitable space. And that includes, uh, of course, many areas of disease phenotypes. So in that sense, that's the justification to start with the Anthropocene. 
Uh, new global health challenges uh, emerge at a rapid pace as a consequence of the Anthropocene. Um, some examples that you're all familiar with, uh, uh, the most obvious one and that some people in the center here are actually working on, uh, emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases, increase in systemic diseases or degenerative diseases, um, and the dramatic increase in environmental pollutants where we haven't a clue what they all are doing to health in the long term, but uh, the short-term picture that we do know is very grim. Uh, think about endocrine disruptors and think about the prevalence of uh, plastics everywhere, microplastics everywhere where we have no idea what it does in the lung, where it accumulates, and all those things are basically new disease challenges as a consequence of the Anthropocene. Now, I said before, the Anthropocene is a, a consequence of ultimately coevolutionary dynamics. It has a very long and complex history. We will talk about some of the elements in a moment. Um, but if you think about what actually went on uh, that allowed one species to become that dominant, it's not just you know, random genetic variation and natural selection in populations. It is a much more intricate and complicated process that involves large-scale transformations of regulatory structures and niche construction, lots of niche construction, something that we refer to as extended evolutionary dynamics. And that we will talk about at length in a few minutes. Now, disease patterns, uh, the ones that we briefly sketched, uh, one phenotype of the Anthropocene. So if you think that the Anthropocene is a consequence of coevolutionary dynamics, then it's appropriate to look at different features of the Anthropocene basically as part of the phenotype or phenotypes in plural. And it includes all types of diseases. Now, what we really need to do in the context of uh, what the Global Futures Laboratory wants to do uh, and what the Center for Evolutionary Medicine wants to do is basically use scientific insights uh, to intervene. And uh, to intervene in the context of, you know, how can we not reach planetary boundaries on the large scale and how can we successfully intervene into those newly emerging disease patterns that we see in the Anthropocene. Intervention, of course, requires understanding, and that's why we need uh, an appropriate understanding of the underlying uh, dynamics and mechanisms that drive those large-scale changes. So to set the stage for what we are talking about here, and since we're talking about um, uh, medicine here, let's just look at two interesting parallel conceptual developments. Uh, one how our conception of disease has shaped, in this case, over the last 2,500 years or so. So disease, originally, in the Hippocratic corpus, uh, was basically conceptualized as being out of balance. The whole Hippocratic corpus is about balance and being out of balance and how can you restore balance. So it's basically a systemic conception of disease. That was pretty much the prevailing conception for many uh, centuries. And then we saw an interesting process uh, happening that gradually moved from a systemic perspective to a more localized paradigm. The localization started getting really serious in the context of pathological anatomy, sort of a couple of uh, centuries ago, where it uh, became clear that you can classify different diseases based on what organ they affect and what they do to the organ, and that's basically a localization attempt. Now, localization started on the anatomical level and then gradually moved all the way to the cellular level. Um, what it implied, of course, was a different conception of causation uh, because it's no longer a systemic imbalance, but it is something specifically going wrong in one particular location. And that basically uh, then led eventually, so I'm simplifying here a couple of millennia, uh, to a very successful application of a reductionist single cause paradigm. And the whole idea of pathology uh, was to identify the right correlation between a specific cause and a known disease phenotype. 
And of course, soon we entered the single gene paradigm because what more can be wrong if we can trace a particular disease phenotype to an underlying uh, mutation in a particular uh, gene. So we then uh, reach the area which we have been very successfully researching in for the last several decades, a basically genetic and molecular conception of disease. There's a parallel development in the context of evolutionary theory. Uh, where initially uh, evolutionary thought was all about large-scale morphological transformations. Again, a more systemic uh, framework. Uh, that then followed a similar pattern of localization causation all the way to genetic and mo uh, molecular, that uh, molecular variation was then sort of specifically reconceptualized as the variation within population. So no longer were you worried about, uh, you know, what's the relationship between uh, an earthworm and a beetle, and what are the homologies in there, and how can you understand those large-scale transformation. It was about, you know, how does a nose get longer or things like that. Um, that led to a specific mechanism of causation, namely that natural selection is the main driver of this type of evolutionary change, which then also followed the same line of a single cause all the way to the genetic and molecular level. So that we now uh, predominantly describe evolution as basically uh, the change in allele frequencies through time, or so we did a couple of years ago. Now, what of course happened in both evolutionary biology as well as in medicine was the realization that while this would be extremely elegant, if we could trace everything down to a single genetic or molecular cause, life is more complicated. And so uh, what we see now is that that reduction is simple genetic molecular causation um, is no longer appropriate for understanding anything of interest in disease or evolution, but rather what we deal is a much more complex system of causes based on extremely detailed and complicated molecular interactions, and not just molecular interactions, that can be described mainly in form of networks. Networks of gene interactions, networks of social interactions, you name it. So if we take those trends seriously, then of course it becomes clear uh, that phenotypes and diseases are now increasingly recognized as complex systems, and you get um, ideas such as network medicine, which is an approach to medicine predicated on the formal uh, apparatus of complex system, system theory. Problem with those things, such as this sort of a big Nature Review genetics paper introducing that account uh, by uh, Laszlo Barabasi and his colleagues, uh, basically stating everything is very complex. We begin to know how complex, so we have to reconceptualize disease as uh, a property of the per perturbations of those complex interacting systems in cells. Then they write a big book about this. Uh, Network Medicine. It's a very interesting book. I can highly recommend it. Uh, it's over 400 pages and 16 chapters. However, references to evolution, zero. So uh, they only have gotten one part of the message. Uh, so uh, this is where basically uh, uh, discussions over the last two years here in the, in the center set in. Uh, because originally when we brought Randy and uh, had something to do with that, so the center was set up under the standard paradigm of evolutionary medicine that you can read here, uh, establishing evolutionary biology as an essential basic science for medicine worldwide. Yeah, that's a good mission. But what exactly are we doing? And so as the, as the center uh, evolved, uh, discussions um, about its re tooled or rebooted mission uh, led to the uh, formulation of the new center mission, which is basically Precision Medicine 2.0. And I'm stealing those slides from Ken, uh, who as the new director, has the, his job is to sell this vision. So he created some very funny slides to do that. So um, the whole point here is, uh, what do we mean by Precision Medicine, and particular Precision Medicine 2.0? It is, in a way, uh, a hybrid approach, given what we have seen before. So there is still 
um, an appropriate flavor of this kind of successful driving, let's say, reductionist approach in the sense that we try to uh, define it as finding the treatments for the right in the individuals, the right care at the right time in the right place. So there's a lot of right, 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 very specific and individualized. Uh, if that would be the only thing, uh, it would be a very futile effort. Uh, but it's not the only thing. Because it also recognizes the underlying uh, trends that we are now talking about much more complex causation and more complex systems. And so while as precision medicine 1.0 uh, was focused more in this sort of molecular variation paradigm, where the idea was uh, you soon will get at birth, uh, you know, whatever medium you prefer, your whole genome, uh, and then uh, that will explain everything. So that's basically on the idea we need to uh, know everything about molecular variation, and that is, that's it. We can then approach health and disease. Precision medicine 2.0 uh, takes a much more systemic approach by taking many more layers of that complex system into account. So, sounds pretty good. I mean, this is basically what we uh, cooked up as the new vision for the Center for Evolutionary Medicine going forward. And of course, it begs the question, you know, what kind of evolutionary theory do we need if you want to do that? You know, you can do the precision medicine 1.0 very well with population genetics, because it's all about identifying genetic variants. You can't really do that with the standard framework of population genetics. And so Ken found a good slide representing a complex system. Uh, so uh, basically, we need to figure out what goes on underneath here. This is basically what we The way the center does this, just to sort of finish that pitch about the new vision of the center here, is with a, uh, a set of signature projects um, that all uh, fit within that kind of enlarged theoretical framework that I uh, hope to present to you over the next couple of minutes, namely, uh, understanding the sec uh, how sex differences affect disease, um, consequences of tempor different temporal scales, sort of what do we actually do with old adaptation and new environments, and then some more imminently uh, uh, applied projects that also require a much more inclusive framework of evolutionary um, theory, namely uh, resistance issues, and uh, uh, what we can actually do uh, and infer from ancient pathogens. Okay, so this is the center. Uh, now let's step back, uh, and since there are at least a few trained philosophers in the room, let's engage them. Uh, some, of, some of them are maybe like mathematics. That's where it really sits. So we have, in not just in, in evolutionary biology, but in any science that deals with complex systems, uh, we have a predicament. So we have successful descriptions and series of what's called microstates. So we can characterize variation, let's say, on the molecular level in the context of disease. We also have successful descriptions and series of macrostates. Uh, for instance, in the context of evolutionary theory, I mean, even though I'm prone to make fun of population genetics, which you have to understand I was trained in, so there are actually two recovering population genetics in the room, Ken and me. Uh, and we can tell you doing that for a living is bad for your mental health. But uh, the problem that we have with this is that population genetics works. But it only works in a very select set of circumstances. But the select set of circumstances where we have successful series of macrostates and microstates leads to the assumption that all we need to do is basically a very simple mapping between the microstates and the macrostates. Um, for those of you who have ever read a paper in population genetics that starts with, like, let's assume a locus A and then let's assume a locus B, and then let's assume that the genotype equals the phenotype. That is a very simple mapping assumption. You can make it a little more complicated, but not really. So examples for this kind of behavior, which is uh, understandably successful, but scientifically pathological, 
uh, are, for instance, economics, where you have the two fields of microeconomics and macroeconomics. And uh, you have to pick if you study economics. And once you pick, you're not allowed to talk to the other guys. Similar like in molecular biology and ecology and evolution departments in the good old days, we also were not allowed to talk to each other. Um, same problem. Microeconomics leads to successful uh, insights into how firms operate. Macroeconomics leads to some successful insights in the dynamics of business cycles and uh, inflation and things like that. The assumption that if I know enough about micro, I will get macro, is the dream of the big data universe, and it's completely bogus. And uh, the same would be in, uh, in evolutionary theory, where you also can't simply get from molecular evolution uh, to phenotypic evolution. Because that simple mapping function, genotype, phenotype, let's just find the miraculous formula of how it works, is not what will, what will be successful. So rather what we need is we need to understand in that intermediate level, or that meso level, uh, the rules of complex systems transformations. And that's a big challenge because that's pretty messy. This is basically Ken's diagram here. Everything goes haywire in certain things. So what can we actually learn about that mesoscale? And what examples do we have where this actually was, has been successful? So I give you now a two-minute version. I hope I can do it in two minutes, uh, of uh, some uh, historical background in the context of evolutionary theory about how those things actually have evolved over the last 170 years or so. This is the standard history. Every evolutionary biology textbook has a version of that history in it. And it's the one that uh, evolutionary biologists like to tell themselves because it's a very triumphalist conception of history. So we start with Darwin, as you know what he did. Uh, descent, natural selection, gradual conception, completely messed up inheritance. Doesn't really matter, only took a few decades. We get Mendel and population genetics with Morgan. We get the rules of transmission genetics. We have some ideas about the physical basis of heredity at that time on the chromosomes. We have a successful formalization of uh, the hereditary process in terms of transmission genetics and later on population genetics, which was based on ignorance. This is an interesting story in the history of science. We, could, we only have population genetics because uh, in 1910 or so, we had no idea what a gene was. We, we, the gene was a conceptual abstraction uh, identified through the rules of transmission. And with this conceptual abstraction, you could build up an elegant mathematical theory. If we would have known what we know now about how complex the molecular gene is, we would not have population genetics, because nobody would, in their right mind, would have tried to formalize this. So ignorance, bliss or not bliss, depending on how you relate to population genetics. But um, you know, based on th those abstractions, it actually worked. What they didn't know in the 1920s and 1930s, A, what a gene really is and what it does. So that uh, was sort of bypassed didn't really matter because the abstractions were very well chosen and very successful. So what happened then in the modern synthesis, you con we connected those formal approaches with something more realistic rather than some you know, breeding experiments with Drosophila. And it was connected as an explanation for speciation, for adaptation. And you get that whole range of um, evolutionary biology uh, known as the modern synthesis. The assumption. Once you connected population genetics to something real in biology, was of course that you needed a simple genotype phenotype map. As I said before, the problem with mapping between micro and macro. And that was explicitly stated, those texts who bothered to think about it. And that became sort of the critique uh, about uh, starting in the 1970s that the the assumption that the genotype-phenotype map is simple is not really true. 
So where do we get information? Well, we need to know something about development. And that's where you then get uh, evo devo, evolutionary developmental biology, which some of its proponents says it completes the modern synthesis because it introduces a more complex picture of the mapping between genotype and phenotype through the lenses of developmental systems. What didn't change in 170 years was what is an explanation in evolution? Namely, uh, an, exp an evolutionary explanation is one that is based in the adaptive dynamics of populations as the primary uh, force that accounts for evolutionary change. The assumption here basically was that the developmental mechanisms in that sense are secondary. All they do is they give us some idea about the genotype-phenotype map. That's, of course, only one story. There's another story, uh, an alternative history of developmental evolution. Starts with Darwin, but we pride ourselves that we read Darwin a little more carefully, which is hard because this guy wrote a lot. Uh, and so we find out that he also talked about the origin of variation. Actually, Darwin had a conception that the problem of evolution is two questions. The first question is the origin of variation, and the second question is what happens to variation once it exists in a population. The last 150 or so years after Darwin were all about the second question. What happens to variation once it exists in a population? And we begin to understand that, and population genetics works. You know? But uh, if you want about the origin of variation, then where do you find out about that? And that's a different route. It goes through cell biologists and developmental biologists, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, who tried to understand how a multicellular organism can come about from one single cell, a fertilized egg, the problem of differentiation. And what is the causal role of the hereditary material in determining differentiation? And they ask such question about what's the relative contribution between the, the cytoplasm and the nucleus and things like that. But they got a lot of insights with extremely complex experiments. And they were really smart thinkers. Because what you see here, hereditary material as a structured system uh, controlling or governing development is a direct quote from Theodore Boveri from 1906. So they knew that it's not just single genes. It's a very complex system that governs a very complex process, namely development. The problem was at that time, how can we experimentally get a hold of that? That's a long history. I missed that, so people tried to do it experimentally. It was very complicated. The first thing they found out what could identify were single pathways of multiple genes contributing to make a particular phenotype. That was Kuhn, uh, conceptualized immediately as interacting networks, but no way of knowing how to get at that, which then was formalized in 1969 by my dear friend Eric Davidson and Roy Britton uh, in their famous paper about cell regulation in higher cells, a theory, which basically sets up the paradigm of regulatory evolution. And the it's very easy to understand from a logical point of view. So if you have some mathematical or logical inclinations, you will get it immediately. So syllogism. Every phenotype is the product of a very complex regulatory developmental system that we know and study in developmental biology. Therefore, every variation of a phenotype has to have some corresponding variation somewhere in that regulatory system, which basically means that major phenotypic transitions um, can only be understood through changes in the regulatory system that governs development. That's the logic of developmental evolution. And we now can do this experimentally, and there are lots of data that actually highlight how those gene regulatory networks operate. What's really interesting here is that here the explanatory framework for an evolutionary explanation is different. The primary explanation for phenotypic evolution is seen in the, in the mechanisms of development, in that regulatory paradigm that actually explains how we get a variation in the first place. The population dynamics that have been studied so far are secondary. They only deal with the variations that can be produced, and not everything can be produced. That is an important insight from the regulatory evolution paradigm. So it's an epistemologically separate framework for understanding evolution. 
OK, so with that in mind, the question then becomes, what kind of evolutionary theory helps us best understand global health challenges in the Anthropocene? So what kind of evolution do we need? Can we get away with population genetics, which is very easy and elegant, or do we have to take into account some different elements of evolutionary theory? And my argument is, of course, you can't get away with population genetics. So you need something that we have labeled extended evolution or extended evolutionary theory. So the whole motivation behind the development of extended evolutionary theory was, on the one hand, the gene regulatory network perspective and the regulatory evolution paired with some other insights, I didn't give you the whole history, that the interaction between organisms and their environments is not just described as a fitness function, which, a which is good for a mathematician, but bad for a biological reality. Because organisms very actively shape their environment, and that's a phenomenon that has been referred to as niche construction. Now, what happens if you combine regulatory network perspectives with niche construction perspectives? Um, that's what basically extended evolutionary theory does. What it also does, it um, integrates, therefore, the mechanisms related to the origin of variation, whether it's an evolutionary novelty or a pathology, which is part of that regulatory paradigm, with evolutionary dynamics uh, that, uh, and more complicated evolutionary dynamics if you take niche construction into account. Um, and if you do that, and since uh, you know, I'm uh, also at the Santa Fe Institute, which basically means I have a license to be totally crazy, uh, then uh, we try to do that not just for biological evolution, but also for social, cultural, and knowledge evolution. But that's sort of a side story here. So we did this. We developed this framework. Um, and um, what actually do we mean in more detail by regulatory uh, networks and niche construction? So to summarize what I told you briefly, so regulatory network perspective helped to discover the mechanisms controlling the development of phenotypic characters and their evolution. Very successful experimental paradigm. Niche constructions have highlighted that multiple interactions between organisms and uh, environments. And it also introduced an important uh, new concept, namely of multiple inheritance systems. Get to that in a moment. Um, and if you combine those two, what you get is a multi-layered approach of uh, complex interactions between regulatory networks at different scales. Uh, because it's not just the genome that has a regulatory network that matters. You can extend that regulatory network. We have to extend those regulatory networks all the way out into the environment. And I will show you some examples how this works in a moment. So let's sort of back, let's sort of look at the regulatory network paradigm. So that explains everything about a sea urchin, at least for the first uh, eight, well, 32 hours or so. So it's the most complete gene regulatory network. It's just genomic. And of course, if you study the first day and a half in the life of a sea urchin, that's what you need, because those are completely exotic creatures in the sense that environment doesn't play a role in uh, a sea urchin larvae formation. They develop a larvae or they die. There are no other options. Not like more complex systems, uh, such as those, if you try that perspective uh, on social insect or the developmental evolution on the superorganism. And it was in this context that we developed um, a system, an explanatory framework, that extends the regulatory network pers perspective from the genome all the way into the social context of the colony. You know, this is of those species of ants, one species, the soldiers and the nest worker, uh, two orders of magnitude size difference. And so sort of there's an interesting phenomenon. If you take a colony of those guys and you remove the soldiers, which is relatively easy to do given their size, uh, then um, the colony will upregulate the production of soldiers. So what's going on here? So somehow the ants know how to count, and they realize we don't have any soldiers left. You know, several candidate mechanisms how they do it, pheromones or tactile, it doesn't really matter. So you have a regulatory network in the brain uh, of those nurse ants. They realize we need soldiers. 
the queen just keeps laying eggs. And what goes on next is that they begin to treat those eggs and then the larvae differently by feeding them differently in terms of what they feed them and when they feed it. So basically what that means is that there's a neural network in the brain that makes a decision. It leads to a particular behavior. The behavior activates physiological uh, cascading signaling networks inside of the developing larvae based on the stimuli that they receive, which ultimately so another signaling pathways goes inside of the genome, changes the patterns of gene expression, and you get a soldier. So this is an extended network of regulatory systems that controls the development of those phenotypes. Well, did a few things and did a few mathematical models of that. Another way where we applied this perspective is the evolution of cell types. Because cell types is another interesting phenomenon, how do they come about? And it's also a case of regulatory evolution where basically we could identify a core regulatory signature in the uh, cis regulatory complexes uh, of those genes that, that, that determine cell type fate. And you can then develop a whole you know, experimentally based and comparative narrative where you can figure out how those sister cell types actually evolve in evolutionary history. And you can then actually model it. And I was tempted to show you the model, but no. Uh, but the, why I'm bringing it up here is basically because this type of, of model is what we need uh, to bring in the complex systems approach in the mapping from microstates to macrostates. Because this is what a complex systems model that involves both gene regulatory network elements as well as environmental and niche stimuli that basically fills in that space that we don't, don't, just don't simply assume I, ha I can you know, sequence a particular nucleotide substitution and that explains why I have a different cell type. No, you need to understand everything in the middle. Okay, so regulatory uh, and niche construction. So what is the contribution of niche construction? Well, several, but uh, uh, the first insight that we have a more complex uh, dynamic conception of interactions between uh, systems and their environment. But another important one that came out of the niche construction uh, discussion is that we actually have multiple inheritance systems. As you see with this shift there to the your, le your right uh, uh, figure here. Okay, what goes on here? So niche construction basically means organisms construct their niche, you know, beaver dam as a prime example, but many others. Uh, and that means that as long as those features in the environment are stable through time, they are actually part of the inheritance system. Because remember, population genetics was discovered uh, and formalized when we had no idea about what a gene was. So inheritance or heritability was defined by correlations between phenotypes across generations. Everything that is stable enough and can contribute to how particular variants persists through generational time is part of the inheritance system. And this is basically what people who think that everything that, if it's inherited, it has to be genetic. It's basically BS. Do your math. It's not. Uh, and, uh, and niche construction theory did this because they highlighted those features that are stable enough in the, in the environment and they called it ecological inheritance or niche inheritance, many things, in particular in the context of cultural evolution that plays a role. But it's formally an important role. The problem, sort of one footnote for the few who actually like to do math here, um, the problem with this approach is that when they write it down, they still write it down as a differential equation system where you say TP over DT, and then you basically do a genotype by environment interaction matrix. So by doing it that way, you, try, you do your very best to eliminate the dynamics of the complex system interactions. OK. This end of distraction. OK, so um, what actually follows? from that perspective. It follows that we need to f understand two more dynamical processes as part of the evolutionary process. Uh, first, uh, you know, both regulatory network and niche construction can be formalized as uh, complex networks. They expand hierarchically. That's easy. But then you get two more processes external that, we could, that we labeled externalization and internalization. So think about it this way. So I'll give you a, a narrative because this 
I have a picture, but it's lousy, so let's do it with hands. Um, so you have a system, it has an internal state. It interacts with the environment in a constructive way. Formally, that means it externalizes an internal state into the environment by a beaver building a dam, for instance. Now that the dam gets passed on because it lives longer than the lifespan of a single beaver, so it's a part of an inheritance system. Now we know what I showed you with the social insect that those regulatory systems, they expand outward hierarchically into the environment. That means every stable entity, everything that's externalized in the environment and they are long enough, can be incorporated in a subsequent regulatory state that determines a phenotype. So it's not just evolution as being sort of this vertical transmission process. You have to understand two horizontal processes of externalization and internalization. Conceptually, that's clear. Mathematically, it's a nightmare, because that means that the, our nice differential equation framework no longer is appropriate, which makes it an interesting problem. Um, so, um, yeah, externalization, what I just said, you know, the system constructs and creates potentially new regulatory elements that it externalizes into the uh, environment. And internalization means that the incorporation of those elements into the environment. Why is this important in the context of you know, evolutionary medicine in the Anthropocene? So think about it, what uh, our system, I'll give you a prime example. Our behavior, our human system, by producing all those new chemicals that we put into the environment, and that they are stable enough into the environment, and we are beginning to figure out how they actually affect through regulatory mechanisms, the development of fetuses in the, in, in the subsequent generation. This is what I'm talking about here. This is this externalization, internalization dynamics. And this is why this is the, I would argue, the right kind of evolutionary framework for what we want to do in evolutionary medicine. OK, there's a lousy diagram that you, nobody understands because I was not, my co-author drew that, so it's blame Jürgen Renn. Uh, but um, I sort of hand-wavingly described it. So, but what follows from there is um, we have to describe evolutionary dynamics not as the change in the frequency of a set of, equivalent, of an equivalence class of objects, which is the formal definition of population genetics, but rather as the transformation of complex networks. There is some mathematical theory for that. It has an interesting consequence. If you do this, then for the first time, we have a historical conception of evolution and not just a temporal conception of evolution. The problem with population genetics and formal mathematical evolutionary theory is that it is basically Newtonian. So a differential equation system, if everything dp over dt, basically means you can run time backwards and forwards. But we know evolution is a past-dependent historical process. So how do we formalize that? And if you do it with those systems of network uh, transformation, you get a historical rather than a temporal operator onto the system. So this is a formal. So before we uh, close in a few seconds, no, more minutes, um, let's just look at an example. I gave you sort of hand-wavingly the endocrine disruptors or anything that we put into environment. But there are, of course, other systems that are prime example of those um, external regulatory dynamics. So cancer, for instance. So there you have whatever version, doesn't really matter, it's complicated, uh, the cellular and molecular pathway of uh, cancer causation. And that was still done under the paradigm that all we have to identify are the appropriate genes, particularly RAS and other genes like that, oncogenes. But that soon was... Uh, uh, put in question by the realization that cancer progression actually uh, involves a dynamic cancer niche. And if you don't walk you through this, but basically what it is, you start with some per perturbation inside of a cell. And what it actually does, it actively reshapes its environment. It sh reshapes its cancer niche. And we are beginning to realize that those multiple interactions between the constructed niche and what goes on inside of the population of cancer cells is what really 
is the feature of cancer. It's also important for potential interventions. So a prime example of that externalization, internalization dynamic that I uh, told you about as the basis uh, of extended evolution theory. Here's a slide, nice one, where they then try to measure exactly. So if, uh, if your tumor cell actually splits into a support cell and, a, and another tumor cell, then what are exactly the molecular interactions? So what are the externalization, internalization dynamics that drive those subsequent development of the tumor? But then in the context of you know, precision medicine 2.0, that's only part of the story. Because then you have to extend that network into all kinds of other things, all the way to socioeconomic factors and the like. So you get this nested hierarchy of regulatory niches that we need to understand. Could do the same story with infectious diseases. I just sort of highlight you know, a very small part of it. So yes, it's very important. There are some of the ones that we uh, like to talk about, particularly smallpox, another wonderful disease. It's a great disease when you have to talk to undergrads these days, and you are the only person in the room who would survive a smallpox epidemic because I was still vaccinated. That puts things in perspective for them. Um, uh, then you can actually shape uh, and map, and this is a nice exercise, you know, and Jane knows I can talk about that forever, about what infectious disease, how people died, shaped what event in history. I mean, this is wonderful stuff, but it's basically all part of this kind of extended evolutionary dynamics that I would describe. And this is uh, basically then how you can, uh, don't bore you because you know, Sylvie can talk about those things much better than I am. And what do you have to consider if you want to actually intervene successfully in infectious disease situations? So let's conclude more or less on time. Um, so conclusion for evolutionary theory from what I just told you. Uh, we need to think about what do we need, what kind of theoretical understanding do we have to have to overcome that micro macro straight mapping problem. And that's basically complex systems. So from the point of view of simply speaking as evolutionary theorist, the next version of evolutionary theory, and that's the one that we need for evolutionary medicine, is one that actually takes this meso level that complex system as the operator between micro and macro states seriously. Um, if you do this sort the of framework of extended evolution theory, we add two more important processes, namely externalization and internalization. Um, the formal mathematical basis for evolutionary theory will then be not simply sort of population dynamics and differential equations, but rather the mathematics of complex network transformations. And that gives us time as an operator. And it's actually doable. So that means that this evolutionary theory is fundamentally historical rather than temporal. It's fundamentally co-evolutionary if you think about this external uh, and in externalization, internalization dynamics. I mean, something that evolutionary ecologists have always known, except you guys were stuck with the wrong kind of mathematics. And um, in the context of uh, medicine, understanding those dynamics, as you see with, the, with, with cancer evolution, basically uh, provides a, uh, a basis for uh, targeted systemic interventions into that system. If you do a set second set of conclusions specifically about health, then we have to sort of, health right now, we have to expand into this framework of the Anthropocene uh, and the disease patterns or phenotypes in the Anthropocene, and we have to try to understand how they are basically a consequence of those co-evolutionary patterns. And what I'm talking about here are the kind of diseases that we are now actively creating, like the ones as a consequence uh, through endocrine disruptors, chemicals in the environment. Those kind of diseases that we haven't really systematically approached, but this would be a framework how we can do that. And this is sort of part of, I think, what that center also wants to do here. Uh, and uh, then there are several implications for global public health. Uh, we have to sort of somehow figure out how, what are the consequences and how we deal with that dramatically increased rate of exposures. And we, the way we systematically can do that by not just saying, oh, there is somewhere a carcinogen out there, 
but by looking at that regulatory network perspective and saying what do we know about the basic biology of those developing systems and what do we know about the extended niches that we have constructed and what are those interactions. So it's not falling into the wrong paradigm looking for the single gene. Now we look for the single carcinogen because somebody needs to get sued, I guess. But we have to look at uh, the systemic interactions of those regulatory systems. Um, which means we have to really understand those complex causation and etiologies of disease phenotypes. But again, positively, <clears throat> by doing that, I think we get a better view of how we can specifically design interventions that are derived from an understanding of those complex networks. I managed to talk in 50 minutes. I've never done that. <laughs> Jane, you can prove that. I've never done that. <laughs> OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Manfred. Any questions? Good, I can talk for 10 minutes. I can, I can start with one, and then I'll go to Ken. So I was wondering, actually, because um, it seems like mathematically we can do this, right? Yes. Um, it's, was, it's not easy. I was wondering, can we, can we actually do it, though? Because it seems to me that there's two issues here. One is knowing what environmental factors really affect all these different or, and two, being able to actually collect the data that you're going to need, right? So do you, what's your take on it? Do you feel like we're there? Uh, well, on that level, no. But uh, I think uh, w what the example with the carcinogens is, if we think about, let's stick with this example, if we think about that you have a particular cancer type and uh, you do some standard epidemiological analysis and you sort of identify a candidate for an environmental carcinogen. And then you spend all the money trying to identify what it is. That's about as useless as trying to identify just a single gene. So by having that theoretical framework, we would sort of look at the data collection differently because it would be guided by a different theory. Um, I'm a theorist. I don't have to worry about that problem. But no. Uh, but uh, the, uh, so there is, particular in, in, in the context right now, I mean, they're joking aside, there are some actually broad implications. Uh, in countries, uh, sort of an interesting thing. So if you collect the right kind of health data, and if there wouldn't be like in the American system and multiple insurance companies and all kinds of things where you never get anything, sort of take a European country uh, where we have very good data and then take one European country that is very liberal in its interpretation of the EU data protection guidelines. In Germany, you can't do anything like that because you immediately get slapped. Um, in Austria, they have found a more creative solution to this. If the state sort of authorizes you, you do it, you can data mine everything. So some of uh, our collaborators from the Global Futures Laboratory in Vienna have access to the total health data of several years of Austria. Uh, if you do that, then you actually find some completely novel pattern of comorbidity. And so you find that, well, if I di diagnose somebody with that, there is a great statistical correlation that seven years later they might also develop that other m disease pattern. So, you know, inspired by those kind of things with the right kind of data, we can collect the data, but it will be a big mess doing it because of all the other issues connected to data. But at least we have an idea how to do it and what we can do. Yeah, just to follow up, actually, they're, they're doing that also. Uh, we actually heard a talk a, a couple weeks ago of, of people that are trying to do that with large-scale data mining where you can do it in the U.S. And as you've just said, there's really fascinating new patterns of disease and morbidity and things that emerge if you actually start at that principle of trying to do this alternative mapping strategy. But but I guess I would ask, could you, could you uh, foreshadow a little bit about what the developing new mapping framework looks like uh, to help people in the room get a better understanding of how we don't do it with, how you would do it other than with differential equations and other approaches? Well, yeah. So 
I didn't show you those kind of data. So uh, the, the gene regulatory network <coughs> model of Davidson. So it's a complete picture of the sea urchin. So uh, uh, Eric managed to actually translate it into a computational model. And then once you do, and it, ha it basically operates on network interaction based on Boolean operators. So it's a network-based uh, approach. Uh, once you have a computational model like that, you can experiment with the computational model. So you, it becomes predictive. So you can basically say, what happens if I knock out that gene? And it gives you an outcome. And then you knock out the gene, and you see whether you know, the prediction was right. And this model actually has been experimentally verified um, quite a bit. Uh, before Eric died, we were setting up a, a program that then sort of uh, is now on a very slow burner not to just look at knockouts, but to also look at gain of function mutations, sort of trying to explore, can you make predictions about the evolutionary future in the sense of what phenotypic states are accessible to that system? So, so you can do it in that way. But sort of to combine your question and, and, and Sylvia's question in that sense is that um, with the data, of course, if you look simply at the health data, uh, you are again, conf it's already interesting and more complex, but it's what the physician measures. If you combine information about geolocation, environmental exposures, which you can do if you know where those people lived, then you can build models that go outward into the more extended regulatory niches. And sort of in an interesting thing, I'm going to see Anne sitting there, now this is, this is the funny thing of what they are now doing with the ancient DNA. Because, of course, nobody can complain. But anyway, the, uh, but it's sort of interesting that the kind of fine-grained uh, ancient DNA sequences and patterns and transformation with what we actually know about specific environmental metrics at that time, can that actually give you this kind of co-evolutionary dynamics between environmental and sort of genomic changes? You know? and it's sort of, you know, if you have very little ancient DNA, you might as well have to do something else with it. Even you can sort of, the motivation is there. But conceptually, it's very interesting because they're realizing, you know, it's particularly also the, sh the influence of diseases in human history, the influence of diseases and environment in human history. So we are beginning to get model systems and approaches that take this into account. Any more questions? Thanks, Sylvie. Thanks, Manfred. <clears throat> so with, you and I have talked about some of this stuff before, uh, but I see your position hardening in some interesting sorts of ways. So I'm getting older. <laughs> join the group. Um, so are, you're going to make the argument then that the network is going to be the unit of selection yes. in some sense. That I can't even formally prove. Yeah. And then you're going to posit a strong genetic basis underneath there somewhere? Well, that, that I think, uh, I, I not, I guess no. the question, how, do you, how are you going to make that transformation, and, and how, does that, how does that differentiate you then? See, the see if, you, if you sort of, this is sort of an interesting exercise why formal approaches are very useful in science. So we could formally prove by simply looking at uh, genetic networks in the context of the simplest population and quantitative genetic systems that ultimately there always will be, the network will always be a unit of selection. So there's a formal proof, ironclad mathematics. If you have that, then if you make that conceptual leap and say, well, but you know, ultimately we know empirically that the causation in the networks is not simply genetic, then the formal proof means that there has to be structures, network structures that can act as unit of selections that are basically mixed between uh, genetic and contextual or environmental elements. We just have to find them. And th that's where the niche construction uh, inside that you actually have multiple inheritance systems comes in, because that's all you need from the point of view of the mathematical seer. It just needs to be inherited. And so that sort of raises then the question about coevolution, particularly in the context of disease, uh, in a systematic way, but you say if, there, if a particular population lives continuously in an environment, 
that has the following factors that can, that we now begin to know empirically how they influence, let's say, development, because they are in the water or whatever it is, then from an evolutionary point of view, it's completely, you know, no brainer and logical to say, well, then the selected units is not just simply a genetic response to an external environment, but selection actually acts on those interacting units. And so now the question becomes, how can we find that? And that's sort of what Ken uh, tried to capture with this funny slide, <laughs> precision medicine. And data, in the big age of big data, we have uh, a better chance of actually finding good cases for that, if you know how to look. And with the caution that you're not just getting correlation as opposed to causation. Well, out of those big data sets. Well, that's the problem is the big data sets, but you know, the whole point is if you get a strong correlation and you need to figure out what is the underlying causation. I mean, that's simply methodology, but if you're not lazy. Assuming you, you've got an underlying causation as opposed to just a big correlation. Well, yeah, then you won't find anything, yes. All right, I'm going to cut that discussion off here. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it's, th it's becoming threatening? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on time. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Manfred.